those watching and listening, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, I hope that you're blessed by this message, and I encourage you to pass it on. Pass it on to anybody that needs to hear it. I'm sure there's someone out there that um, will be blessed by this message as well. All right, so this morning, we're going to begin our study into 1 Thessalonians, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church, and we're going to be only covering the first four verses here. Um, I don't want to rush through this. Um, there's a lot, even in this first chapter, that it's a lot of um, deep, uh, meaty stuff that I want to make sure I covered. And um, I've titled today's message, Chosen by God. Chosen by God. Uh, now, before I begin reading today's <coughs> passage, I want to briefly just elaborate on a point that I brought up last week on when we did our introduction. Paul's purpose for writing this letter. Now, according to what we're told in Acts chapter 16 and 17, neither Paul's entrance to Thessalonica nor his exit were ideal. He came to Thessalonica from Philippi after having been illegally beaten and cast into prison. And later he was forced to leave the city in the cover of darkness. Unbeknownst, unbeknownst to the Thessalonian saints, Paul had made several attempts to return to Thessalonica, but we'll be seeing throughout this letter that he, was, he had been hindered from doing so by Satan. Now, it's clear from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians that he is very concerned about this church, about this church that he planted, and he strongly desires to be with them again. Due to Paul's absence, there may have been some concern on the part of the Thessalonian saints. They were aware, they knew that Paul had been justly accused, unjustly accused of wrongdoing, and then that he had been hastily kicked out of town. As time passed, there was no communication. It was silent. It was almost as if Paul had ghosted them. That is, until Timothy arrived. But before that, even when there was no communication, there must have been really genuine concern from the Thessalonians. Well, this first letter is written to put the hearts and minds of the Thessalonians, of the Thessalonian believers at rest. Paul wasn't only doing well, he had great affection for them. He thought of them constantly and prayed persistently for them. He had made several efforts to return to them and was determined to return as soon as possible. More than this, though, Paul felt that his ministry among them was great success. In the strongest terms, he conveyed confidence in their continued growth and ministry. Well, as we see, as we'll see, these first chapters of this letter are filled with expressions of love for these saints and of his confidence in what God was yet to do in their lives. So as we cover it, you're going to notice that this epistle, this letter, contains little or no rebuke. There are a few words of caution and exhortation, but there will be many more words of love, affection, and confidence regarding the future. But first things first, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, which I might be doing throughout this letter, but 
before going over all that, a properly written letter, it must begin with a good introduction, with a good salutation. And that's what we'll be going over today. Our passage this morning will consist of two parts. Paul's greeting to the church. And then we're going to be looking at the first part of, or the first of many ways in, we, in which he expresses his thankfulness for them. And so before I begin reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord God, as we open up your word, um, we are so thankful that you've given us your spirit to be able to read and understand it and to know what you're saying, Lord. Lord, we are thankful that you've called us your own and that we're your children and that we're your church. I pray that these words that we're about to read, even if they're just a few, and to some may seem insignificant that, well, Lord, we know that your word is powerful. We know that every single letter comes from you and it comes from you. We know that it has deep meaning and has power, Lord, and we pray right now that we will receive it or that we will surrender ourselves completely to what you have to say. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought those that are here. Pray that you will continue to give them the strength to, to sit through this message, to sit through your word, Lord, just as children love to sit at their parents' feet and just listen to stories as well, Lord. I also pray for those watching and listening that you will bless them, Lord, and that you will have a word for them too, that lives will be changed and Yes, Lord, marriages, relationships, Lord, will be restored. So fill this room with your spirit. Protect us and speak to us now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Letters written in the first century Greco-Roman culture began with three statements which are found in the opening verse of this letter. The names of the writers the names of the addressees or the recipients, and a word of formal greeting. Now, as I covered last week, the Apostle Paul was the writer of this epistle. His name appears first, and he spoke of himself in the singular in other places of this letter. But as amazing as Paul was as a man and as an apostle of God, he usually didn't work alone. He usually had a small team around him. Whenever he could, he surrounded himself with godly men. And here, he mentions who, those, who two of those men were. The first name he brings up is Silvanus also known as Silas. He was a long and experienced companion of Paul who traveled with him on his second missionary journey. Acts chapter 16 tells us that he was in prison and set free with Paul in the Philippian jail. And then in Acts chapter 17, we're also informed when Paul first came, that when Paul first came to Thessalonica, Silas came with him. Therefore, the Thessalonians, they knew Silvanus well. 
They were familiar with him. They knew his heart. Paul then mentions another close companion whose background is briefly mentioned in Acts chapter 16 as well. Timothy was a resident of Lystra, a city in the province of Galatia. He was the son of a Greek father, and according to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, a Jewish mother named Eunice. From his youth, he learned the scriptures from his mother and grandmother. Timothy was a trusted companion and associate of Paul. And he accompanied Paul in many of his missionary journeys. And in chapter 3 of this letter, Paul states that he sent Timothy to the Thessalonians on a previous occasion. So they were also familiar with him. They knew who he was. Well, immediately after identifying senders, Paul identifies the recipients, the church of the Thessalonians. The, thir- the church at Thessalonica was comprised of Gentiles who had turned from idols to God, the one and true living God, and of Jews who, recognizing their Messiah, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The description of God as Father insinuates security, love, and strength. And while under, as, as he, under his breath, or with the same breath, he also says, and the Lord Jesus Christ, signifying the union between Christ and believers. By choosing the words, God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, Paul's intent was to focus their attention on their true identity. This is who they truly were. And this was the basis of Paul's confidence in what God has done and will yet do in this church. And, my friends, church, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, so are you. You, that's your identity. You are a believer. You are in Christ. You're part of the church. Furthermore, by closely linking God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul is indicating that their unity is what makes the church exist. You see, without either of them and or apart from them, there is no true Christian ecclesia. Ecclesia, or in other words, that's a, a Greek word for church. There is no true church. And finally, at the end of verse 1, Paul ends this greeting with a blessing. Grace to you and peace. Grace, for those who may not know, is God's undeserved favor in every aspect of our lives. Peace is the unruffled quietness which defies the crashing, crushing circumstances of life. Grace is the cause and peace the effect. Repeat that. Grace is the cause and peace the effect. Friends, let me also put it this way. No one, no one can experience peace until he or she receives God's grace. Why is that? Because true peace is the result of an understanding 
that our salvation, your salvation, rests on what God has done rather than on what you must do. Church, if you're not already aware, over the past few decades, a significant shift has occurred in many and in the way many American Christians view the church. It's no longer uncommon, for example, to encounter a book or a speaker describing church members as customers, potential converts, or members as prospects. And the, and the gospel, church activities, and programs as product, products to be marketed. Worship is confused with entertainment, being good with feeling good, and faithfulness with being successful or blessed. Meeting the needs of the customer is said to be the key to church growth, equally as revealing is the language one hears people using to explain why they changed churches or to, re or to evaluate a Sunday morning service. Maybe you've heard those kind of comments before. Oh, I'm not getting fed at that church anymore. It's too, they're only feeding me milk. They're not feeding me, you know, the, the meat and potatoes. Or, again, rather than discussing what, you know, what was taught on on Sunday, they just overly criticize. Do you see how many times Angel messed up today? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, right? Right? You know? But more and more, in other words, we are viewing church in terms of what it can do for us. The way in which how many people view church, no doubt influenced by the narcissism and consumerism of contemporary American culture has shifted away from a God-centered perspective on reality to a human-centered one. That is, there's been a shift from a theocentric perspective or worldview in which humans are viewed as the creation of God to an anthropocentric worldview in which God is widely viewed as a projection of the human mind. When viewed from this anthropocentric perspective, the church becomes just another human organization, just another club created by human beings just to meet human needs. It's no real surprise then that many people view the church primarily in terms of what it can do for them. It's just another instance of the subtle and therefore insidious ways contemporary American culture is infiltrating the church today. Well, over and against this growing tendency, stands the opening verse of Paul's letter with its resounding emphasis on God and Jesus Christ. He reminds us that the church, whether in Thessalonica or elsewhere, is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned just a bit ago, it doesn't even exist and certainly has no life apart from God and his saving work in Christ. This means, my friends, that the church isn't just another social organization 
it isn't just another club. It's nothing less than the people of God called together by him for his worship and glory and commissioned to spread the gospel, the good news of God. See, it's God who calls humans to follow, worship, and serve him, not the other way around. God doesn't exist for the sake of the church. Rather, the church exists for the praise and glory of God. Paul, em Paul emphatically reminds us of that point in the opening of this, this letter. As John Stott, Stott observes, what stands out of Paul's vision is the church, uh, what stands out of Paul's vision of the church is God-centeredness. Now, understanding this point, understanding what I just said will fundamentally change the way we think about church. We'll think of the worship service, for example, less in terms of what it does for us and more as an opportunity for us to glorify, praise, and worship God. Hey, not be familiar with a song, uncomfortable with a song. You may not like the way the music is or the singer, the way the singer is singing it. But again, it's not about you. It's about praising and glorifying God who has your life in his, in his hands. He's given you, even though sometimes it may not seem like a lot, he's given you so much. When you're worshiping him, you're worshiping the God who has blessed you since the moment you were born. And you're practicing also for the day when all the saints are gathered and worshiping the Lord God Almighty. Also, will consider the ministries of the church less as a means of meeting our needs and more as opportunities to serve others as disciples and servants of Jesus Christ. We will view gathering together with other believers for worship less as an intrusion into our weekend and more as an opportunity to declare by the way we spend our time, our allegiance to the one true God. In this way, by both understanding and adopting a theocentric rather than an anthropocentric view of church, we can begin to live out what it means to be a church that is truly in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want nothing more than to live this out as well here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. That's why we don't spend most of our budget in advertising and programs and trying to get as many people in these doors. I do believe that in a sense, it's organic, but it also, growth happens by those that are here, inviting others and, and those that are watching and listening, you know, curious about what, you know, this church is all about. As long as the church, uh, as long as God has the doors open in this church, I want us to be a church that is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. beautiful way to 
begin this letter. So now with the rest of the time that we have together, I want to cover now the first couple of verses of this letter. So let's return back to our passage and pick up in verse 2. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. Again, the Word of God says, We always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. No, no doubt you've probably heard some preacher say, if you ever find the perfect church, please don't join it. If you do, you won't be perfect. It won't be perfect anymore. <laughs> now we know that since local churches are made up of human beings, saved by God's grace, no church is perfect. But some churches are closer to the New Testament ideal than others. The church at Thessalonica was in that category. At least three times in this letter, Paul gave thanks for the church and the way it, it responded to his ministry. And if you think about it, nowadays it's really hard to find a pastor as thankful as he was. So what characteristics of this church made it so ideal and such a joy to Paul's heart? What was it? Well, in this chapter, chapter 1, he mentions four of those characteristics in the two verses that we just read, he states the first one, and he states that one at the end of verse 4. He has chosen you. In other words, he was joy, his joy, his, his, what made it ideal for him, what made, it, what made him so happy was that they were an elect people. The word church in verse 1 means a called out people. Whenever you read a call in the Bible, it indicates divine election. God is calling a people, a special people from this world. Seven times in John 17, our Lord referred to believers as those whom the Father gave to him out of the world. Here, Paul stated that he knew the Thessalonians had been chosen by God. Now, I'm going to get into an interesting topic here that has been debated a lot, has confused a lot of people, and that's the doctrine of divine election. It confuses a lot of people, and it frightens others. Yet neither response is justified. Someone once said, try to explain election, and you may lose your mind. But explain it away, and you may lose your soul. Truth be told, my friends, church will never truly understand the total concept of election this side of heaven. But we shouldn't ignore this important doctrine that is taught throughout the Bible. Now, let me share with you some obvious facts about divine election. First of all, salvation begins, it begins with God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation. 
In John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, He, speaking of the Father, chose us in Him. They're speaking of Christ. Before the foundation of the world. The point being is this. The entire plan of salvation was born in the heart of God long before man was created or the universe even formed. Number two, salvation involves God's love. In this letter, in chapter 2, verse 17, Paul calls these saints beloved brethren. Not only beloved by Paul, but also beloved by God. Church, God's love made Calvary possible. And there, there, on Calvary, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He died for your sins. But it's not God's love that saves the sinner. No, it's not God's love. Do you know what it is? It's God's grace. God in his grace gives us what we don't deserve. And God in his mercy does not give us what we do deserve. This explains why Paul often opened his letters in the same way he opened this letter. Number three, salvation involves faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourself. To get, it's God's gift. See, we didn't get there, but verse 5 of this chapter implies that Paul, Silvanus, or, or Silas, and Timothy brought the gospel to Thessalonica and preached in the power of God. Some people who heard the message believed and turned from their vain idols to the true and living God. Did that happen to you when you heard the gospel? Did you hear it in power that you immediately gave up your idols and followed the true and living God? Whatever idols those were, those addictions, those uh, perversions, those... immoral behaviors. Those little gods, those toys, money, career, whatever it may be, those idols, those things that you were making, that you were making more important than God. Did you give those up? Yes. Then the gospel was preached in power. You heard it, and you accepted it. The Spirit of God used the Word of God to generate faith. Paul called this, called this sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called it that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And finally, salvation. Salvation involves the Trinity. As you read this letter, you'll discover the doctrine of the Trinity. Christians believe in one God existing in three persons. God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind, all three persons are involved in our salvation. 
Understanding this will help you escape dangerous extremes that either deny human responsibility or dilute divine sovereignty. For both are taught in the Bible. See, as far as God the Father is concerned, I was saved when he chose me in Christ before the world began, before he created the universe. As far as God the Son is concerned, I was saved when he died for me on the cross. As far as God the Holy Spirit is concerned, I was saved when I was sitting there in my bed in Oakland, California, back over, it's almost been 25 years. I was sitting there just reading the gospel of John from a Bible that a friend gave me. And it all just started to make sense. And when it got to the part that said I needed to confess with my mouth to Jesus is Lord, I put my Bible down. And that's when I gave my life to the Lord. That's when I surrendered my life for the first time. Again, as far as the Holy Spirit is concerned, I was saved at that moment and trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. At that moment, the entire plan, the entire plan of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit fell together. It all came into place, and I became a child of God. And maybe I, you have a similar story. If you had asked me that evening when I was sitting there on my bed, accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, or even just reading the Bible, if you would have asked me that night if I was one of the elect, I would have been speechless. Why? Because I knew nothing, nothing at all about election. But the Holy Spirit witnessed in my heart that I was a child of God. And if you've been forgiven of your sins and been washed clean and have the Holy Spirit living in you as well, then he is also a witness in your heart that you are also a child of God. Friends, the election of God isn't a matter of the Lord casting his vote on our behalf because he sees something that impresses him. No, God elected us before the foundation of the earth apart from anything we've done or haven't done. I agree with D.L. Moody when he said, I'm glad the Lord chooses me before, I'm glad the Lord chose me before I was born. I don't think he would have chosen me after I've done some living. So, how did Paul know? How did he exactly know that these Thessalonians were elected by God? Simply put, he saw a change in their lives. It was a change, a genuine conversion. There was a genuine repentance, a turning away from their old lifestyle. If you put 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, next to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, which 
will eventually get there, you will get the picture. In verse 3, your work of faith. In verses 9 and, uh, verses nine and 10, you turn from God to idols. In verse 3, your labor of love. Verse 9 and 10, to serve the living and true God. Verse 3, and patience of hope. Chapter, verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven. So it comes down to this. The person who claims, anyone who claims to be one of God's elect, but whose life hasn't changed, there is no fruit there is no genuine change in their lives, is only fooling themselves. Those whom God chooses, He changes. Those whom God chooses, He changes. This doesn't mean that they're perfect, but they are possessors of a new life. That can, that cannot be hidden. Can't hide it. It's gonna be obvious, it's gonna be clear. People are gonna know there's a change, that there's a change there. Something happened. It may start off slow and gradual. It may be with others, it may just be in your own behavior. Hey, you know what? I'm just not gonna turn on the computer today. I'm just not gonna go by the casino this weekend. I may just, I'm gonna stop calling that girl or that guy. It's a change. And it's God who does that change. Now, faith, hope, and love are the three cardinal virtues of the Christian life and the three greatest evidences of salvation. Faith must always lead to works according to James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. It's been said we're not saved by faith plus works, but by faith that works. If the Thessalonians had continued to worship their dead idols while professing faith in the living God, it would have proved that they weren't among God's elect. Love is also an evidence of salvation Paul wrote in Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, he writes that we are taught by God to love one another. We serve Christ because we love Him. This is the labor of love that Paul mentioned. Again, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. The third evidence of salvation is hope. Hope waiting for Jesus to return. The return, and again, we'll be covering this when we get to verse 10, but the return of Jesus Christ is the dominant theme in both Thessalonian letters. Do you know any unsaved people that are awaiting the Lord's return? No, not really. Maybe a few here. But who are the ones that are awaiting, eagerly awaiting the 
return of Jesus or the rapture. It's us. It's believers. That's where our hope is. Relying on it so much. We're, we're holding on to that promise and we know God keeps his promises. And that Jesus will one day come back. He's never proven himself to be false. He's never, he's always come through. And he will again. That's our hope. Again, his return. In fact, when we get to chapter 5, we're going to see that when the Lord catches his church up in the air, unsaved people will be totally surprised and be shocked. Church, faith, hope, and love are evidences of election. So if you want to know, am I really saved? Am I really part of the elect? Ask yourself, do I I have faith? Do I have hope? And do I have love? Yes, you know, we all mess up and fail at times. Sometimes our faith is down in the gutter. Sometimes we... Our faith is in shambles because of something crazy that comes in in life. Sometimes we have no hope. I know these things because I've had them before and I still at times struggle with them. And there are times I don't love especially when I'm really angry or having an argument with Robin. The feelings I have aren't of love. But you know what? God has forgiven me. In the end, when all those feelings are gone or done away with or have passed, come back to the truth. I come back to the fact of the matter and that is yes. I have faith. I have faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I have hope that I will see all those all my all those people that I've loved that have passed away that are with the Lord now. I have hope that I will be with the Lord in heaven. One day, and love, yes, I do. The fact is, I, sometimes I love too much to a fault. I got to have good people around me that make sure that I don't, that people don't take advantage of that. We must... Those are, again, uh, evidences of our election. I'm not asking, again, for you to be perfect, to have all these things in order 100%. um, But whatever you're lacking, whatever you're short on, ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to give you the strength. Ask the Lord to give you more faith, more hope, more love. Who are those people that you just have a hard time loving? Is it the homosexual? Is it the cross-dressers? Is it the prostitutes?
Is it your neighbor, your coworker? Ask the Lord to start giving you that love. And he will. He will pour that love and he will remind you of the kind of person you were before you came to him. And he will remind you he loved you and he's poured his grace out on you. These three spiritual qualities faith, hope, and love, are bound together and can only come from God. A local church like ours must be composed of elect people, those who have been saved by the grace of God. But our problem today is the presence in the church family of unbelievers whose names may be on the church contact list, list, but not written in the Lamb's book of life. All of us, all of us should examine our hearts to determine whether or not we truly have been born again and if we belong to God's elect. If you're unsure, if you don't know, well, now is the time to be 100% certain. Examine your heart. Are you born again? Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Is ye convicting you of sin every time you come across it or near it? Is he telling you, don't look at that, don't go there, don't smell that, don't sniff that, don't drink that? Are you listening? First of all, if he's convicting you of sin, He's there. He's speaking to you. If he's not, you won't have this issue, this problem. You'll just be like, whatever, I'll do whatever I want to do. But if, if, if you don't, if you don't have the spirit living in you and, and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to the cross to have your sins forgiven. So again, whether you're here, you're watching, you're listening to this message, Lord wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants you to come back to him. He wants you to be broken and empty. And if that's where you are in life at this very moment, let me lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to be born again. So wherever you're at, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes. With all your heart, Pray this, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it, and I humbly ask you to forgive me. I now truly believe that you died for my sins And that three days later, you rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins. I want nothing to do with them anymore. I, I repent. And I confess you 
as my personal Lord and Savior. You alone. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. Now ask you to fill me. Fill me to the top or overflow, Lord, with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me and teach me and convict me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that sincerely with all your heart, you will know it, and the Lord knows it. Guess what a host of angels right now are celebrating? That is a, a lost sinner has been found and now spent eternity with the Lord. We're now saved. You're part of God's elect. The next steps is important. Don't just pray that prayer and that's it. No, there is now a walk. Some people call it a marathon. Some people call it a race. It's going to be a race of hills and valleys and mountains and deserts. But you're not running it alone. You now have Jesus with you the entire way. So if you need help in your next steps as a new believer, let us know. Contact us. Reach out to us. Send us a message, and we can help you. We can try to find the resources to help you. You're not in this alone. Wherever you're at, there are other believers that are in the same position as you and want to rejoice with you. We can help you find them. If you're here locally, I'm tired of some of these churches that watered down and aren't really declaring the word of God and aren't, are just not sharing the word with power, the gospel message with power. I want, you to invite, I want to invite you to come check us out. And sit here for a week or two and, and just learn as we go, especially as through this letter of the First Thessalonians, to the First Thessalonians, or the first letter to the Thessalonian church. I really believe that the Lord will teach you and instruct you and show you many things. But again, I'm just the messenger, the Lord doing the work. So again, if you're looking for that, I invite you to come check us out here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel on the corner of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. I want to thank you for joining us. I know we just covered the four, four, first four verses here, but um, this is going to be a, a, a great journey. And I invite you to come check us out again next week as we continue on. Um, and I invite you to, to also to share this message with anybody out there that, that you know needs to hear it. I hope you have a great week. May you be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvcc.com. 
If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.